That's pretty good. Yeah. Everyone's good. Everyone's Hello, everyone. I'm Megan, and this is Michelle. And we'd like to welcome you to our first ever for this year uh, speaker series. <laughs> Cole is our first speaker, Cole Allen. She's a resident of St. Mary's, and she's our library uh, chair head. So, <laughs> uh, so Cole is here to talk about uh, mining and everything we don't know about what you do. Yeah. So welcome. Yeah. Thank you for coming and being here first. And um, stay after, visit, have some goodies, some coffee. Um, and we are continuing our speaker series throughout the summer. Our next speaker is June 27th. It's the last Tuesday of every month, and it's Charles Sharon. So welcome to Cole. Thank you. Thank you, Meg. Um, and thank you, everybody, for coming. I know the vast majority of this audience, so that adds a little extra something. Maybe nerves or fear. <laughs> but I don't know. No, <laughs> no I'm kidding. Um, but maybe a, not a little bit. But I, I, I present probably once or twice a month to different crowds, to mining uh, execs or First Nations people or government folks or whoever it is, but this is my first time giving a public lecture. So I'm very excited to be here doing this today. Um, and I'm also really thankful for the efforts that the staff has put together to put this on. And I'm happy to be the guinea pig for the first one of these. So uh, as chair, you know, it's great to be here. They, I hear about all the great programming they do. So it's great to finally be sort of part of one. So um, <laughs> you may not be able to see the title. But it's the see beyond today, next generation assessment in Canvas Mid North. So, my work, um, if you change the slide there, you go. Um, my, my mentor always says to start with a cartoon. Because it, it, it's a, this one's a bit dark. Um, but at the same point in time, um, it's important to sort of frame the context of my work. So, a lot of people, when they think about environmentalism, they focus on sort of, there's a lot of, of individualism and sort of internationalism. So if individualism, it's the things we do every day, uh, but maybe buy organics, take transit, um, uh, try and buy local, those sort of things. And those chain have market effects and those sort of things like that. Then there's the international side, climate change negotiations, uh, anti-whaling, all of those things that take place at a larger scale international level. And my work sort of takes place in, the, in, in between. And what I particularly focus on uh, is mining developments in northern Canada and the infrastructure and developments that surround those, uh, making those choices and how we do that. If you can hit the next slide for me. This map, which I did not create, you'll get to see my map making skills in a bit. And I'll tell you, uh, something else. But um, <laughs> this is sort of what we call the mid-north of Canada. So my primary research cases that I'm going to be talking about, research cases and, and the cases I work on, because I'm also, along with being a PhD candidate at the University of Waterloo, I'm also uh, a consultant, and I, I work in um, these developments. Uh, one of them is here called the Ring of Fire, and, and also you should probably know about uh, the oil sands development, tar sands, however you want to phrase it, up here in northern Alberta. Uh, I'll also be talking a little bit about a few other cases, but as you can see, sort of this belt here is where you've seen a lot of industrial development in Canada over the last 25 years. But one of the other important parts of this is that you don't have as much of a population. So a lot of the developments that happen here are massive in size and scope and impact. But you have most of our population lives here and along here. So you have fewer people impacted parties except a lot of First Nations communities and Indigenous communities. Um, and these <coughs> developments happen at a much larger scale in things that wouldn't be able to necessarily fly in the south. Um, so we're gonna, I'm gonna get sort of into discussing environmental assessment because that's what I primarily focus on, but there are lots of different uh, instruments that we use to make environmental decisions. But my focus is on something called environmental assessment. An environmental assessment, I wrote a little definition for you guys. Is environmental assessment attempts to anticipate the potential negative environmental impacts of an undertaking and devise ways of mitigating them. It's sort of like a uh, position time saves nine concept. Came out of pollution abatement legislation from the 1970s. 
And so when any of these, we have environmental assessments for lots of things. The Green Bridge had an environmental assessment. We have tons of environmental assessments across Canada, provinces, territories, and the feds all have environmental assessment legislation, legislative processes. But mines and big industrial developments and things like that, like big roads, dams, all those things, have much bigger environmental assessments. And because those developments create a lot of controversy and have huge impacts to the way not only the landscape is, but the, but the socioeconomics of a region, like they'll change it fundamentally forever. Though they tend, to, the environmental assessments tend to have a lot of conflict, and they have a lot of um, a lot of scrutiny, but it, it, particularly afterwards. So, so this is what my area of research focuses on. So, um, if you can flip to the next slide, I'm giving you a taste of the of the lovely graphics I've used here. Uh, <laughs> but this is how currently we use environmental assessment. We use something called project-based environmental assessment. And so, what a project is is like one mine or one dam, a road, one individual thing. And you may think that's, you know, that's a big deal to, to assess the potential negative impacts and try to, what we call, mitigate them. Um, and it is, but it only has a certain scope. So what we do in an environmental assessment at a, at a project level is undertaken by what we call a proponent, or the person who's proposing to do the work. So if you're a, mine, a mining company, will do the environmental assessment in order to prove that none of these things, that they're not going to have significant adverse effect to the environment. So they'll look at things like local and at-risk endangered species, that's available technologies as alternatives of what we could do. Um, one of the big things with mines is creating bonds for cleanup um, for legacies. That's something that they may have to discuss. It may not be in the assessment process, but it's often linked to it. Uh, pollution and permitting. So. This is the amount you're allowed to pollute. Uh, we do that a lot with effluents in the water and also air pollution. Uh, what monitoring you're going to do to make sure you hit those levels that comes up in the environmental system so often. And no go alternatives, so what happens if you don't go forward? And generally this is phrased as, with a no go alternative, you lose all economic opportunities and everyone is, is, has negative ramifications and all those things. You either generally have the project at its full scale or a totally a no-go. You don't have generally an in-between, which is sort of an ongoing theme of what I'm going to talk about, the in-between. So let's look at what happens often in my made-up world that I'm going to show you uh, in a Canadian island of when you have a project-level environmental assessment. So if you can go to the next slide. This is my community. This is this lovely island. Islands are easier for bounding, so that's why and I could find the, the image on the internet today. Um, <laughs> so this is a, let's say this is a traditional small island in Canada. Uh, you have an indigenous community, small dock, dirt road, uh, only way in and out of the island is uh, a dock. You've got endangered species on multiple parts of the island. They may go through the center. This might be a, a way you have, uh, that might be the range of the species. Sacred indigenous sites, coastal fisheries, it's sort of that idealized concept that we have this perfect environment and we need to maintain it. That's sort of this, this image. But there's other elements that we need to talk about, uh, about environmental assessment and, and making these decisions. And that, so this is an indigenous community in a, an isolated and remote place. They're very likely poor, extremely poor. They may not have access to uh, clean, reliable water. They have, may not have um, access to schools and uh, so there's a lot of the communities I, w I work with, once they get to grade eight, they have to move to go to school. Um, you have uh, a lot of people who want to have opportunities would leave this community to find opportunities on, on a, a more populated area. Um, and, and in some ways, it's, it's, a, it's a challenging life. You would have import food as well as rely on traditional hunting and gathering. So there are, you know, really positive aspects of this community that you'd want to maintain, cultural, spiritual significance, things like that, but also um, economic opportunities that just don't exist with that is. So let's go to the next slide. Okay, so this is my, they found ore. They were staking and they found ore. 
So each of these red boxes represents an in project level environmental assessment. So if you find or, let's say, and if you go back to actually two slides, let's say with this, one more. So each of those different mines would have to go through all of this, all of these elements, right? They'd have to pr show that they're not putting local at risk or you know, local at risk species in any danger, that they're all not having significant adverse effects, that those things are, are being met, those, those, those stipulations. Um, and that they're using you know, best available technologies or they have capacity to change those things and all that stuff. But if you have multiple companies who have all found ore, and you have the government that's maybe putting in infrastructure to support these uh, mines or whatever the industrial process might be, you can have multiple, um, multiple sites come online at once or within very short succession. And because you're only looking at it's almost what is almost considered a sort of, if you're looking at legally, like the private property understanding of, of, of the land, that it's just that, where the proponent has been demarcated their space, what we call cumulative effects are not considered very easily. So if you go back, two more slides. Thank you, remote. Um, <laughs> AI. I'm doing a great job. Um, you will have, you could have five mines, all receive approval at the same time. In order to support that, you could have a large road that's developed as well as small roads. That would require an environmental assessment as well. And then, so there are, there are obviously ecological consequences with that. You would have ha habitat fragmentation, rangeland would be changed. Uh, you would have, uh, in, uh, obviously, effluents that we might go into water systems. And you also would have air pollution and because when you have concentrated a lot of, of facilities at one spot, you can actually have climate change happen more locally at a, ha a faster rate. So things will heat up more directly right in that one spot. Additionally, to support these levels of, of development, you'll probably need more people. You need people to be able to at least fly in and out to work. So you'll likely have a mine, I'm sorry, you'll likely have an airport, you might have to expand the dock, those would require environmental assessments. And your community would expand as well. Um, there are challenges with boom and bust communities, which is what we refer to as, as the communities that surround mining development. Uh, because they emerge often so rapidly, you have um, a lot of people come and you don't have the social services necessarily to support them. You have higher rates of crime, particularly violent crime, uh, abuse against women, uh, you have uh, a lot of your people who feel connected or invested into communities, and you have a lot more challenges that relate specifically to that. Additionally, you have the bust option. So let's say, as we're going along, and minerals are very volatile. They're extremely volatile as, a, as a, an industry. That these three mines are owned by maybe one proponent, and they are having financial difficulties. And even though they have not exhausted the ore, there's tons of ore still there, they may close up shop because it's just so expensive to get the ore into that boat out. And they may go bankrupt. Let's say they go bankrupt. Now you might think, oh, that's not a very high possibility. It is. It's very frequent that you have a mining, uh, mining company that'll go bankrupt midway through operation or towards the tail end of operation. So what happens is, they maybe have not contributed all of the bond for cleanup, or they just don't have the money to make the cleanup. So that falls onto the government. Right now, BC has this year $1.27 billion in legacies on that, the cleanup. That's just BC. What we call orphaned and abandoned mines. There actually is now a registry in Canada if you want to look it up. But that leaves, in that sacred indigenous site, as well as along this waterway, a huge amount of a, just a, a, de, a non de, it's unproperly decommissioned mine just sitting there. You have tailings that can go into the water system, which have, a, let's just say, gross stuff in them, um, as well as uh, a lot of infrastructure. You have to have probably diesel power generation and roads and things like that that are just existing that are not going anywhere. Um, and that also puts a huge pressure on communities when you have when you lose a major employer. 
Um, so this is less than an ideal situation, but all the stories I've just talked about actually happen pretty frequently in Canada. Uh, and this is what we want to try and avoid with our assessment and planning policy, which is kind of what I'm going to do next. Slide. Um, okay, so I want to give you a real life example of this uh, cumulative effect stuff. So this is in northern BC, northeastern BC. Uh, the, the, I'm sure you can all clearly read this map because it's so easy to read, but uh, in here is, this is Hudson's Hope, uh, which you may not know, and then in here is uh, Fort St. John. Uh, this is the sort of oil and gas boom that's happening in northern British Columbia right now. All of the black and gray dots on this map are oil and gas wells. On this side is oil and gas wells along with roadways, seismic lines, transmission lines, pipeline tenures, consolidated cutbacks, and agricultural areas with a 250 meter buffer. Why that 250 meter buffer is important is because if you say have uh, uh, a pipeline, you can't, you can't just put agricultural area lands or, or plant and hunt in that area. It is the 250 meters on either side is sort of a no-go. So that is what the land looks like now for the Blueberry River First Nations, who have treaty rights to hunt, fish, and trap in that region. Why this is really problematic for them is that the cumulative effects of this development have, have all of this development, have reduced the amount of available uh, fish, uh, bison, uh, moose, all of these things, as well as contaminated a lot of areas where there would be traditional gathering for medicinal plants, things like that. So right now there's a major case going on, the Blueberry River First Nations against the province, saying that the cumulative effect impacts of all of this oil and gas development have prevented them from utilizing their treaty rights. And so this is a major, this is a major so what I was showing you in that previous slide may have seemed like sort of this imaginary land that I made up, which I did. Um, it's actually happening on the ground, and it's, it's changing Canadian legislation right now. Um, and so this is gonna be something to see that we're, we're watching, that a lot of us are watching to see what happens in this, this case, because as it goes up further into the Supreme Court, what's gonna happen? Uh, next slide, if you would not mind. So what do you do? <laughs> If project level assessment is so challenging to actually identify these, these cumulative effects, what do you do to actually integrate these into our policy? And so what I'm going to talk about, there's lots of ways you can do it, but I'm going to talk about one specifically today, which is called strategic environmental assessment. So strategic environmental assessment looks at the overall large term of development, developing, say, a region or a sector. Uh, so for oil and gas in that region, you would have an oil and gas environmental assessment to see what level of development you would want of oil and gas for how long and when you would, um, and when you would say, monitor it and reevaluate that development. You can also have them regionally, say, uh, which I'll talk about a little bit later, but one region and look what you want that future to look like, like in my, on my island. Why that's different is that we often treat environmental impact assessments as data, we don't have enough data. We have sufficient information to make the decision that this is significant and this is not. So it's sort of looked as, as that we don't, if we had more technical knowledge, we can make the decision. And that often can create these problems. Um, not that the, the, the science is crucial and key, but a lot of these concerns are actually about how do you want to proceed in the future? What do you want your future to look like? And that's a question more, it's political, it's strategic in nature, and it requires a community or a regional or a political level discussion. What do you want to see? So this is something that's being proposed right now at the federal level to do with uh, lands that, they're, that they are impacted by. Um, and it's also happening all over the world, strategic level assessment. So Canada's a little late on the boat on this one. So I'm going to show you kind of a, one example of one. Did you hit the next slide for me? Another, another beautiful map. I'm just giving you guys so many maps today. Um, but this is the Mackenzie Valley Gas Project, which is sort of a, a strategic level uh, concept. 
Uh, some of you may remember the Berger Report from the 1970s, where Thomas Berger went up and to evaluate whether or not a gas, pro I, it, the development of that region would be beneficial for the commun their community. It was a really exciting, for me, historic event that changed how environmental assessments perceived in some ways in Canada. It was the benchmark. And so this region, and he said, he said, no, but maybe in the future. But maybe in the future they'll be ready. So about 30 years after that came the Mackenzie Valley Gas Project. And so because there was this high level of standard to start, they, they, they took a, a really innovative approach to the assessment. There's lots of examples I could take, but I think this one's kind of interesting. So with the Mackenzie Valley Gas Project, they looked at the project and they said, the pipeline was I had this very large capacity, but they were only planning on piping the vol half the volume of the, the capacity of the, the pipeline, if that makes sense. So the 1.6 cubic million, whatever, I can't remember the, the, <laughs> the measure, but it's, it's, a, it's a very large amount. But they realized that since they're only planning on piping half of that, they would have the ability to create, to pipe much, much more if they so desired. So which what was what we call induced development, when you have the infrastructure and the capacity to actually create more development. So what these very brilliant people did was they decided, well, what would it look like if they piped the full capacity of that pipeline? It would look like this. That's, so these are pipelines and gas wells all over the valley, where you have caribou, you have uh, a very traditional population, and and what the the results were was the the gas project could be really beneficial, but not at that full capacity. If you make a pipeline that's smaller to actually pipe the amount you're talking about piping, which was like 0.8 cubic, whatever it was, then it would be really beneficial for the community. It would have a longer term life for the gas project which is something we really want to do. We want to extend the life of mining projects because then you can have greater economic development to, at, to you don't have, you have less of an opportunity for a bust. You don't want something, somebody to come in, grab ore for four years, and skid out, right? Because that doesn't have many benefits long-term for a community, doesn't have many benefits long-term for the government, doesn't have many benefits uh, even long-term for, for ecologically, right? If you have a longer-term, uh, longer-term, yield, it has many more benefits. So they said, yes, but, yes, but. We think it's a good idea, but lower level. Project never ended up going through, because 2008, gas prices, mineral prices, the volatility of this market. But it established another benchmark for this region. So if they come back and they say, we want to do this gas project, that they can go back to where they were and say, is this still a reasonable expectation. Next slide. So, I made up a, in my island and I, how we could, from a sustainability strategic based assessment, potentially what it could look like. So what you would do is you would gather the community together. It's a very broad way of saying that, you know, it would take two or three years to come to this. But you would create criteria to say, what do we want the future to look like? And people on the island said, this is in my get in my community. That we do want industrial development. We do want mines. We want those jobs. The average Canadian miner makes $110,000 a year. It's a very, very lucrative profession. So they wanted that kind of income in the community. But they didn't necessarily want to make the island have a lot more people living on it. They didn't want a boom town scenario. They also wanted the mines to try and last longer. So they sort of so in this proposal, it was requested that the mines have a, long, a shorter, have a longer term yield, so their processor might have been slower or something like that. They also wanted to maintain this region to protect an, uh, endangered species and their sacred sites. So they petitioned to have a biosphere reserve made. This happens quite a bit. Uh, so it's a challenging designation to get, but it allows people who use traditional practices to continue to use traditional practices, but for the rest of the area is protected. And they wanted to diversify economically. And tourism was an area that they thought would be a beneficial way. So they put this beautiful hotel up. 
it's a very, very common um, approach when you're looking at economic diversification. A lot of indigenous communities really want to see tourism development, uh, which is why I threw it in. And because they didn't want the airport, expanded the dock. That was one way they could have gone. That was the feature that I, in this very short, uh, <laughs> on my beautiful island, that was, was presented. But these are actually examples of all things that have happened in Canada. Boise's Bay, they didn't want to have an airport at the huge extent, and they didn't want the mine to leave after seven years, which was the proposal. So they actually had it so that the, they could only freight the ore every six times a year, and they had to make the processor smaller and create a longer term lifespan for that mine. And what happened with that mine, interestingly enough, is technologies improved, and they were actually able to continue to expand the life of that mine. So these sort of things actually do happen. Um, they're not just in my made up rule. Next slide. So, on to my actual work, um, which I'll, I'll, I'll keep pretty brief. Uh, so this is a, 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 a strategic environmental assessment I'm working on for Parks Canada on Wood Buffalo National Park. Um, Wood Buffalo National Park is, as you can see, the largest uh, national park in Canada. It is in northern Alberta. It straddles onto northwestern the Northwest Territories. There's some really exemplary things about this park, um, including that it's one of the only places that whipping crane actually breed in the whole world. Um, additionally, it has a, a population of bison and wolves that have killed each other and run away for a really long time. And <laughs> they also have this thing called the Peace of the Basket Delta which is a very, anybody who's interested in hydrology should go in and read about the Peace Athabasca Delta because it is super fascinating. Basically what happens is the water from the Peace River comes up into the delta as does the Athabasca but the flow is smaller and it fills the delta but one of the ways it fills the delta is at about this point here there's an ice jam. And so with the ice jam the ice builds up, builds up and then under the pressure of the flow of the water, as well as heat, the, from just thermal heat from the, as the area warms up, the ice breaks, and from the force of the water, the ice is pushed onto the land, which expands the physical uh, breadth of the delta. It's a pretty majestic thing to actually see. They call it the, the magic. They call it the magic, which I think is a pretty cool. Those hydrologists are pretty neat guys, the magic. <laughs> um, so what's so what's happened is the magic's not happening anymore. We have in 1968 the we call it the Wacky Bennett Dam because it was a this dam that was built in 1968. It's huge, tenth largest dam in the world, Earthfield Dam was built. And it changed the entire flow of the Peace River, preventing the ice jams from happening. Uh, they've had some ice jams from modifying the flow, but it, because of how electricity works, it totally changed the actual flow of the river. So the delta got a lot smaller. When you get when the delta gets smaller, you get fewer muskrat, fewer migratory birds, uh, changing in the water chemistry, all these things. Simultaneously, here's Fort McMurray, you have the oil sands and you have uh, water the affluence, water withdrawal, and um, uh, air pollution. So it's actually much hotter over Wood Buffalo National Park. It's a climate change has happened faster than in other places in Canada. So you have all these factors combining to create a huge amount of pressure on this park. So what happened was UNESCO, because this is the UNESCO World Heritage Site, said, uh-uh, this isn't good. And the Megasu Cree, who are dependent on this region for their traditional economy, petitioned UNESCO and said, this is really bad. So UNESCO has required Parks Canada to have an environmental assessment. Here's what I'm working on. Why this is challenging is that it's much easier to do an environmental assessment before you actually develop. Doing it after you've developed and trying to figure out what further development is going to happen and how it's going to impact it, like the Tech Frontier Mine, which is very close to the park, um, for example, create some complications in my life, but also primarily for the park. 
not just on all just about me, obviously. <laughs> um, so, so that's what we are working on right now. I, that are non-road access that are in this in this region. So what we're trying to do in Yavitam, and we're trying to create an environmental assess, a strategic level environmental assessment for this region. So what that includes, these communities don't have access to running water. They're on boil water for, well, they have access to running water, but they've been on boil water for 25 years. Uh, houses are made of, uh, a lot of them are made of plyboard. There was a string of arsons, arson in about eight years ago, and none of those houses have been rebuilt, so there's overcrowding in a lot of the homes. Uh, you actually, what's really amazing is a lot of those ar the arson was actually related to substance abuse problems, and the community has self-funded an addictions counseling program for their community. And it's been really effective, run by the nurses' station. Um, but if you're a student in Fort Hope, at grade eight, you have to decide how, if you want to go on to high school. And if you want to go to high school, you have to go 300 kilometers south of Thunder Bay, where there is a tremendous amount of racism. It's really horrible for a lot of the people that, that go there. Uh, a friend of mine who works up there, he told me about he was going to college for forestry and how he got mugged in the middle of winter going back from a class and left in an alley. They took his coat, they took his money, and they took a, a crowbar and broke his arm. And there's this huge scar. And it wasn't about a pity or anything. He just was saying to me why he hadn't finished college. But he wants to go back eventually when he feels better. And it was one of those moments where, I was, you know, you feel your privilege all the time. But it was one of those sickening moments where you just can't even visualize it. Can't even visualize it. Um, so these communities are in this really challenging position. It costs $22 for a pound of bacon in Fort Hope. They are dependent on their traditional economy to feed their families. They, are, they also have an incredible spiritual and cultural bond to, to the land. But they additionally don't want, they want their children and their grandchildren to have better opportunities than they did. Lots of people from their communities have had to go south. Like half of, of, of the, the Yavitan community is actually in Thunder Bay and Timmins in these regions where they can have economic opportunities. Um, so the fact is they're in this really challenging position where they would like economic development. And some of them wouldn't at all, but some, some of them would like as much as possible. But how does that, what does that look like? And how does it work for the long run? How do you say build a road uh, from Pickle Lake that can connect all of these communities and be good long term, but also help assist in mining. How do you actually operate an open pit chromite mine in Muskeg? How do you do all these things? I mean, I don't have the answers to these things, questions. I certainly don't. But what my role in this entire process is, is to help them develop criteria based on what they ideally would like for a sustainable community. I'm a resource. I'm a tool. I have all this education and this stuff. So this is what, what is your vision of a sustainable community and how do we peel back the layers to get there? We call it, one of the ways we do that is looking at scenarios. So if we had full development of this region, we had mines operating on the whole thing, what roads would you need? What hydroelectric projects? Because there's lots of hydroelectric opportunities in these rivers. What would you do to have that happen? And do you like what that looks like? What happens if you have no development? what happens in the intermediate areas. And if those, if one of those scenarios is what you want, why do we have to back past that to figure out what we want for the future? And we're working on it. <laughs> I'm probably going up again in July to hang out with these folks to keep uh, on the dialogue. So it's really challenging. And this is primarily, resource development is primarily a provincial concern. So the province of Ontario doesn't have a, huge a lot of experience with mining. So they're also figuring out a lot of this as we go. Um, and it's also really challenging because First Nations concerns fall under federal jurisdiction. So where are the, the feds in the province jurisdictionally meet? With Wood Buffalo, that's actually been a bigger problem because you have BC, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Saskatchewan Northwest Territories, the feds, and like six different uh, First Nations and Indigenous communities. So. Um, if you click the next picture, I have 
couple pictures of, of these are, are not mine because my computer died on Friday. Well, I killed my computer on Friday accidentally. Um, it was it was it was a manslaughter? It was accidental. I, I promise. But uh, so this is sort of you can see the musket. You can, uh, canoeing around here is it's supposed to be really beautiful. And this is Gavkin, and that's the airport um, because it's only fly in. And though these guys all have trucks, they have they brought in on the ice roads in winter, and you just see them rolling around in the trucks. You can always get a ride. It's really fun. Um, and, and they'll they'll drive them around. They'll wreck the suspension because there's like potholes and everything, and they'll take them hunting and stuff. And then they'll resell them because they'll they'll drive them back down because the mileage is really low. Um, so they, uh, they, they which I, I think hey you know colonial oppression that's the one way to get us back right. Um, they, you know, um, so uh, anyway so this is the uh, so this is. This is their community. Um, and they're really awesome people, and I'm really lucky to get to work with them. Um, I think that's it. Um, I'm really excited for questions. It was really nice to actually get to talk to folks from town and talk about what I do. I think a lot of people know I, I do environmental stuff, but I never actually talk about what I do because I feel it might be boring. Um, so it was really nice to actually, you know, the, the folks came to, to listen tonight. Um, now I think it's, uh, I'm excited to, to hear questions and there's lots of options. This is just one, one way we can do things. There's lots of different ways, lots of different planning and assessment instruments. And development isn't all bad. And so that's what's crucial to know. Development isn't all bad. There needs to be economic development in these regions. There's a lot of poverty. There's a lot of situations that we have privilege in Southern Ontario to not have to deal with. And we've, we've benefited a lot from a lot of these resources. But at the same point in time, a lot of the way economic development is done, if it's, if it's not regulated, if it's not considered for the long term, can have really challenging and, and unfair consequences on the people that need it most. So, uh, thanks. <laughs>
uh, I met with a bunch of academics in the area, and they said, it's like Christmas morning. You gave us every present uh, to, about the report. Uh, but it only works if it's a full suite. So it could be starting as soon as probably early 2018, in the new legislation federally. Provincially, it's a different story. Provincially, it's across the board different. Uh, Ontario has actually some really good basis for, for legislation because their, um, their, their le legislation is based on the well-being of, of Ontarians is what their legislation is built, built on. So it sort of has that broader understanding of environmental issues. But I'm cautiously optimistic that things are changing. That said, you can get involved if something's happening. Um, you know, if it becomes an election issue, EA reform, make sure that that's something you say to whoever your, you know, potential MP or MPP is. Um, make sure you follow the, that information when it's going on the internet. It actually makes a huge amount of difference, a, a well done environmental assessment over uh, a poor, poorly done environmental assessment. The Site C Dam in British Columbia is one of the worst environmental assessments I've ever seen in my entire life. And What's happening is it became an election issue. Yeah. And that's why the Liberals did not win a majority, yeah. right? Yeah. So the like Greens went with the NDP over the Site C issue itself. Exactly. And Site C is a disaster. Not just in environmentally, because you're flooding like a, a massive amount of productive uh, environment, farmland and also changing the ecosystem. But it's extremely expensive and it's going to raise hydro rates the same as in Ontario. And you don't have anywhere to put that power. It's not needed. And they have all of these uh, old and abandoned wells that you can use for geothermal that they haven't explored. And there's other things they haven't explored. And so um, it's just encouraging always alternatives. And also understanding that assessments that are well done cost more. But in the long term, they cost the government and less. So uh, that's my long answer to that question. How long does a traditional assessment take? A long time. A uh, year, maybe two. For a big project like that. Could be longer, could be shorter. Um, but it takes 77 years from an average mine in BC from staking to production. And it goes over 77. And in that time, there'll be seven companies that own it. So. <laughs> if you're thinking about how long-term an investment of mine is, two years of assessment process is, to me, it only makes sense, right? I mean, this is, a, this is something that you're going to have, and you're going to have a legacy forever. Mining legacy is pretty much forever. Um, and you can, you can take the, you know, you can take the land back to a you know, beautiful environment, but people are still not going to use the medicinal herbs from that land. Right? Do you, do you really want to eat something that had a tailing, tailing spawn there before? I certainly wouldn't. So, um, you know, these, I think that it's, a, it's an investment in time, but again, stitch in time saves time. Yes? What is your um, background? Like, how did you get interested in this? Oh, Gary. That's a, that's a cool question. Um, so, I'm from St. Mary's. Uh, I grew up here. I had some really great teachers, uh, and I didn't know what I wanted exactly to do with myself when I went to university. I was really good at geography, and I really liked it, and, and world issues and stuff like that. So I, I spoke to my amazing geography teacher, a guy named Fred Crafton, who uh, Pete McCash, Mr. McCash, will know from, uh, and uh, I was, and he, so I said, I don't know what I want to do. And I said, I really like this stuff, but I don't know if there's jobs in it. So right now. And so the next day, he's an odd guy, right? He's an odd guy. So uh, he, he's not like one of those guys who would get emotionally involved in the conversation, like, but he, he would really think about what I was saying. And he came back, and he just threw on my desk like this, and then walked away a stack of recommended programs. Um, and the one environment resource studies from University of Waterloo was the one he'd highlighted and said the best. Funnily enough, I think of my graduating class of 50, eight or 10 of us went into sort of geography, international development, world issue stuff, because 
I think because of a major influence in that, because we knew that there were, were potential opportunities and jobs. So I got, I was about to start my, my, my degree, and I went with a friend to, in Toronto to this award show for environmental advertising. It was called the Greening Awards by uh, the Toronto Environmental uh, Alliance. And there was this hysterical man making fun of car ads. And he was this University of Waterloo professor. And he was everything I ever envisioned a professor to look like. He had the white beard, and, and, and he had the cutoff, you know, the shorts that are also pants, and you zip them off. Just in case climate change, the water comes, and you gotta get ready. Um, and he was just, he was exactly what I ever envisioned. And he was this prophet in environmental resource studies at University of Waterloo. And I took his course, and I like, I mean, I didn't, I fell in love, but not like I love my husband, but like in a different way. And, uh, <laughs> and so I said to him, I said to him, I'd really like to take your, I, like it was like an advanced course. So he let me in, and he thought I was weirdo enough that he, he liked me. So then he became my mentor. And as my mentor, he was like, you should go out and try different things. So um, I did a few courses with him, and then I did my master's in, the, in, in global governance, where I studied invasive species and networks that they move around on. And then I did, because it was offered to me, <laughs> a master's in the study of law at Western Ontario, where I also looked at invasive species, but I did some other stuff, some mediation stuff and stuff like that. And I didn't know if I wanted to do a PhD, and so I, I, I contacted Bob. I was like, I don't know what I should do. And he goes, well, I'll, you, you'll, you know, we'll get you money, and it'll be fine, and we'll get you in. And I was like, I haven't applied yet. Like, I'm, I'm past the deadline. He goes, no, no, it's fine. If you want to do it, I'll take you and we'll do it. Um, but I didn't know what I wanted to do my research on. So, but I didn't think it was mine. Like, I certainly didn't think it was mine. And <laughs> Bob is a very convincing gentleman, I will tell you that. And he said to me, you know, I think we should, you should just read this, this bit. Like, I knew I liked assessment work because I think it makes a lot of sense in the world to think about problems before they happen and try and anticipate them. As a human being, we should all try and do that, right? Like that's that's what we should do. We try and think about problems. Uh, and and Bob was um, Bob kept just sort of doing, saying this and doing this. And all of a sudden, I'm in a meeting with people from Yag Yagata. And I'm like, I guess I'm doing this for my dissertation research. He's like, and cause they're talking about me going up, and then they're talking about how they can they want to pay me to be a consultant and all this stuff. And I was like. I was manipulated into this and I didn't even know. Um, so <laughs> anyway, and, and he always told me that, and then I got federal funding from, from the government and sure to do it too. So it sort of just happened that this is an area where there's a lot of work right now and a lot of research. And I fell into it and I actually, it turns out I love it. Not that I love mining, it's not like I love going up to mines or things like that, but I really, really like working with people on problems like this because they're not easy. They're what we call wicked problems, where there's not an easy solution, and you have to work with people, and you have to have conversations and, and expect more from people than, they would, than what's necessarily provided. So that's kind of how I got into it. Um, like anything, it just sort of happens. But there's way more curves in the environment that people sort of speculate there are. Um, and it's not all just environmental education or uh, solar farms or wind farms and things like that. There's lots of different things. And and I cannot, I didn't, I haven't asked for any of the consulting work I've, I, I haven't advertised. If you go to my website, which is at, which is up there, it's not been updated in a long time. So uh, uh, apologies for that if you're really interested. But um, yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting time right now in this field. So how did you come to learn, or how do you come to learn about the indigenous communities? Because I mean, you're talking about a lot of different indigenous communities and therefore yeah. different um, perspectives. How, how did you go about doing that part of well, How thought, do you go about it? Oh, that's that kind of thing. It's hard. Um, there are certain advantages. Well, firstly, I'd like to say there's a, a real benefit in working mm -hmm. with indigenous communities in coming from a small town um, because you a lot of people you watch, from, they come from the cities, they come into an indigenous community, and there's a pace that they expect. Um, and there's stories. People communicate in stories. 
people communicate that I know here in the stories. It's not, um, it's not something that's was totally outside of the realm of my expectations. Uh, but with indigenous communities, I actually wasn't planning on doing much work with them. Um, but I started by, I was a research assistant during my master's in study of law with someone who was an indigenous land claim expert. So he ended up interviewing, I think like 20 elders and I transcribed every interview. He never read any of my transcriptions. Oh, sorry, I'm just a little bitter about that still. But I learned so much. I learned so much. And they were all over Canada. And I would go with him to various places and meet indigenous uh, elders and things like that. And um, that sort of was, it was eye-opening. But then, because I had that experience, people were more likely keen to bring me on to something else. And so by the time that I got this job with Parks Canada, and I'm going up to see them the Cree, though they are very, you know, they're different, different languages, different social structures, all these things. Um, if you're considered, if you have indigenous experience, you're more likely to be able to get the work. Um, and in Yavatung, I don't know why they wanted me. Like, I, I have absolutely, I, they, I still, I had a meeting with them for 30 minutes. I barely said anything. And I've been working with them for three years. Um, and I, I mean, we have, I have had the best time. They're taking me out on the land next time I go up, which will be extremely dangerous, because I do not know how to hold a gun or anything like that. But we're going to go out hunting. It'll be fine. Um, <laughs> you may not see me again. It may be over. Um, but they, you know, I, I don't. I I think that the key working with indigenous communities is to to try and listen more than you talk. And that's a very hard thing to do in academia when you're trained to talk as much as physically possible, right? You're trained to have answers for questions and to, to, to bring, particularly in law, you're trained to, you know, I think, draw things out far too long. Um, but people will tell you things if you just are patient. So that's the, the key part of that. Um, but, it, and, and uh, you know what, it's not, you have to make, you have to make relationships with people, not just the venerated, you're an indigenous elder, and you know, that's not, you need to still make, communicate, like work hard to make relationships. Uh, you know, when I, the last time I was in, in, in Fort Hope, I made breakfast for everybody, and you know, I'm cooking eggs, and they're cleaning their guns on the table, and I'm like, this is not an experience I've had before. Or they were in Guelph, so we went to shoot pool, and go play mini putt, and all this stuff, and I have to tell you, these guys had a, they had a, uh, these are the guys who work in sort of uh, resource development in, for the community, and they are amazing at pool. Oh my god, it was league night in Guelph, and everybody was staring at them, because they were just like, because they had a, they, they have, these guys have much better aim from, from hunting and things like that, but they also had a, a pool table in the basement of the community hall, so Winter, what are you gonna, you know, you're gonna, you know, they don't. They, it's a dry community. Nobody drinks, mm -hmm. so to go shoot pool for a few hours. And so these guys, and I'm, I'm terrible at pool, <laughs> and they, I'm this liability for them. And they just laugh at me the whole time. And I'm like, I'm, you know, I told you that I couldn't shoot pool. That I was in there like, no, it's fine. We're just gonna each take a turn having you as like our, our, our <laughs> liability for this whole thing. But you know, it's it's I think it's about listening and making connections, and you get a lot more information when people are just having a, a meal, or shooting pool, or something about what they want from the world, than when you're in a formal meeting with everybody. So um, I guess those are the things. But I, I'm also pretty lucky. Like I don't. It's a. I mean, I've worked hard to get to this point, but I'm also pretty lucky that these things have happened, and I've been able to. So they just sort of cascaded. Anything else? Well, you guys have been extremely patient. Thank, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for coming, everybody. Feel free to get some coffee. Snapping Turtle gave us some coffee to give out. And then we have cookies, we have water, we have juice boxes. I mean, if you want your inner kid out, mm. you can help yourself. Thank you. Thank you.